so we are very pleased to have uh, Eli Yablonovich. Um, he's a, a very well-known researcher and engineer. He's originally a graduate from applied physics uh, at what we call the other university in Boston, yeah. not MIT, the one across the river. Um, from there he went to, to Bell Labs, uh, back to Harvard, Bell again, UCLA. Uh, he's currently a chair professor uh, at Berkeley. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, has a long, 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 long list of honors and a long, long list of contributions to, to science and engineering. Uh, so that's enough. After all, I'm only supposed to have two minutes and you should have the rest of the hour. And so it's a, it's a real pleasure to ask Eli to tell us about searching for the millivolt switch. Well, it's, it's actually a, a great uh, pleasure to be here. And this talk is going to be a sort of indication that I'm also still learning. And there's still things that I want to find out about. And uh, one of them has to do with uh, solving what I think is a very big problem in electronics. And I'll illustrate that uh, by this picture. Uh, what does this look like? Does it look like a power plant? And it's actually a uh, Google server farm. So it's a Google server farm. And it's actually adjacent to a power plant because it uses so much electricity. And uh, I was uh, given this uh, view graph by uh, an official at Google who happens to be one of my former students. And he told me that this is a confidential view graph because the, you're not supposed to know where it is. So they have servers all over the world and uh, they keep the locations uh, secret as it's a business secret. Uh, but it, it gives you an idea of what the problem is. Uh, the use of, ele of electricity in the cloud is very substantial. So this is an example of what the cloud is. The cloud is up there, but the cloud is actually uh, various physical locations around the world where they use vast amounts of electricity to serve all of our uh, information needs. And uh, that's just data centers. And to give you an idea of what's happening, in 2000 was using maybe uh, one half of 1% of all the electricity in the US and uh, then went to roughly 1%. And in, two, in 2010 uh, was roughly about 2%, whoops. Uh, it was 2% uh, of all the electricity used in the US. But the cloud is just in its infancy. We will be using more and more data services and there will be a great demand uh, for uh, more and more electricity. So this is something to concern ourselves with. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, an example of all the other applications. We're envisioning a future by 2020, swarms of electronics around us all the time. And these swarms of electronics will consist mostly of wireless uh, devices. And uh, it will, of course, you have your cell phone, but you'll also have a swarm of sensors surrounding us all the time. And these will also put a very big burden on the electricity used to do digital functions. We need to uh, make it more efficient, certainly for the battery powered equipment. And the need for uh, lower energy is uh, something a little different from what we've had before in electronics in terms of Moore's law. So I will talk about how we can possibly come up with a new device technology to replace the transistor but which would have the property of being more efficient uh, that would deal with the question of energy usage in data centers, but also deal with all the uh, battery operated device that would be uh, obviously smartphones, wireless sensors arrays, which are a very intensive area of research and even a body centered network, which are basically uh, sensors that you can put all over the human body uh, to assist uh, uh, doctors and to help people who uh, who, whose condition needs to be monitored constantly. Uh, now, I, so the, the main thing I'm going to emphasize is the digital logic switch, essentially the transistor, and how we have to replace it with a device that is more efficient. Uh, now, uh, how do we uh, imagine the parameterization of the energy consumption? Uh, 
Well, it has to do with the voltage. Uh, in fact, the powering voltage of uh, transistor circuits are often uh, designers uh, call this VDD, uh, just the powering voltage. And as we know, uh, power goes as the square of voltage, so we have the square here. And let's just see what has happened to the power voltage for, uh, tr for digital circuits. Well, it's gone down. As we've made everything smaller, it's gone down. And now it's just about saturated. We're not seeing a big reduction in voltage. We're stuck near one volt, and we need to uh, uh, go much lower than one volt uh, to achieve what's possible. We're consuming too much power. So how do we know what is the right energy uh, in digital electronics? How do we know what the theoretical limits are? So I want you to envision a flash memory like this memory stick and uh, ask, well, what is the energy cost? This is one example of a, uh, of, uh, a digital process, simply reading out uh, the memory uh, for example, in a flash drive. And there are many transistors in the memory stick, and essentially you want to know which transistors are on, which transistors are off, and you can do that. It's essentially like an ohmmeter. You measure uh, which ones are, are conducting electricity, which ones are not. And so asking the question, what is the energy cost of reading out flash memory, is similar to asking what is the energy cost of operating an ohmmeter. Now, an ohmmeter is a little bit different from a voltmeter and ammeter because if you open up an ohmmeter, there's actually a little battery inside because you actually have to supply a little bit of current in order to sense the uh, resistance state. So I'd like to answer this very simple question, uh, which you'd think we'd know the answer to, is what is the minimum energy of reading out an ohmmeter? Okay, and so it's on the next slide. And of course, it's complicated. I, you know, I, I don't believe in using equations on slides. So I will talk around the slide a little bit. But before uh, I go through the formulas, uh, just imagine I'm asking, and, and a graduate student, very smart graduate, raises his hand, I know a professor how to do this. If you want to use the least amount of energy, you have to be very adiabatic, very slow, don't deviate from equilibrium, and do the measurement very, very slowly. And uh, the other graduate student says, no, 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 that, that's wrong. Uh, get it over with, do it quickly. Uh, get, put in a pulse of current and just get it over with very, very quickly, and then you will use the least amount of energy. So we will decide now uh, which graduate student was correct, okay? So uh, first, we have to respect uh, noise. So uh, you have Schott noise and you have Johnson noise and so forth, and you can figure out that you need a certain uh, voltage. It's, it's actually uh, optimal to swamp the Johnson noise with Schott noise. That's good, and then we need a, a signal to noise ratio. So uh, the, um, uh, the current, uh, you have the current, and then you have the uh, shot noise here, and you need, you need a good signal-to-noise ratio, so you need a certain amount of current. Not surprisingly, the current per, per unit bandwidth, you, you should measure at least two electrons, otherwise you'll be in trouble. So now you go through everything. The power is the current times the voltage, and there's some nice cancellation here, and everything cancels. You end up with this simple formula. Okay, and say, well, that's with a unit signal-to-noise ratio. With a good signal-to-noise ratio, let's throw in a factor 10. So roughly 40 kT to measure, uh, to operate an ohmmeter. It should ideally cost 40 kT. Now let's figure out which uh, graduate student was correct. Uh, because of the way we worked it out, it worked out per unit bandwidth. So it doesn't matter if you're going fast, and then, then you have a big bandwidth. It's still 4 kT per bit. Uh, or if you're going uh, very slow, uh, and you have a narrow bandwidth, it's still 4 kT per bit. So both graduate students are correct. Uh, and uh, this, uh, luckily, this comes out to be something fundamental that we're accustomed to in physics. 40 kT, hmm. we, can, we can deal with that. that. That's a pretty low limit. But let's get used to the units of 40 kT. It's uh, actually, you can convert it to attojoules. It's 0.16 attojoules for a bit of information. Uh, there are other units, especially among electrical engineers. They like to say, uh, if they make a communications link, they're always striving to, to have the greatest data rate and the least amount of power. So they would measure uh, a data link. They would say uh, milliwatts uh, per gigabit per second. That's typical, uh, the, typically the amount of power required for a communications link. But here we see this fundamental limit. It's essentially the same units. It's not in milliwatts per gigabit. It's, it's nanowatts per gigabit. And this already tells you what the problem is. 
the, the actual practice of electronics uses about a million times more energy than what this theoretical limit we derived on the previous page. And uh, so this is very vexing. Why are we inefficient to such an incredible degree of a million times? And you ask at the, uh, about the different processes. It looks very much like we don't have to be so inefficient, particularly for storage. We can probably, and some people would argue, we're getting very close in storage. We can actually reach the theoretical limit. And in logic, is somewhat similar to storage. But when we communicate, uh, we tend to be very inefficient. Um, and uh, we end up using far greater than the theoretical limit. So why is communications, even over 10 microns on a chip, why is that such a big problem? So let me uh, point out uh, the way we are boxed in uh, when we're trying to uh, uh, do digital electronics. We have so many options for memory and storage. Uh, we have um, uh, flash memory and static RAM and magnetic spin on hard disks. We have uh, nanoelectrochemical cells, nanomechanical gadgets, memristors, phase change memory, uh, et cetera. So we have many technical options for memory and storage. And actually, it's similar to logic. Also, we have many options. But computer scientists, they actually are very worried about latency. And you actually have to communicate the information on the chip rather rapidly. In fact, you really have to go at the speed of light on chip. And then you say, well, how many ways are there to go at the speed of light? Well, ele electrical signals go at the speed of light, and optical signals go at the speed of light. And that's about it. So we don't have very many options for communication on chip. And the, the options, these realistic options I've mentioned, unfortunately, uh, tend to be very uh, power hungry. So what's the problem? If you look at a chip, it is mostly consisting of wiring. And the wiring and the communications you can see are uh, uh, most of what the chip is. In fact, if you look at the cross section here, the, uh, uh, the transistor is a tiny little thing at the bottom, and all the rest of the stuff is uh, wiring. Uh, so uh, there are uh, up to uh, nine or 10 levels of wiring on a chip, but only uh, one level of transistor. So the, the wiring, which is the communication, is really most of a chip. Uh, well, why, why should that be a problem? Let's ask what is the energy cost for electrical communication. So this is uh, similarly asking to what is the energy cost of reading out the flash memory. Now I'm asking about uh, communicating on chip. So this is Johnson noise. And I can take this resistor and I can put it in the denominator. So I turn this into a noise power. And uh, ooh, it looks like similar to the other formula we got. And if we normalize it per bit, it's uh, 4 kT per bit. And uh, wow, that's wonderful. Uh, and if I put in some signal-to-noise ratio, it's 40 kT per bit. And great, what's the problem? We know that's, that's actually uh, uh, a million times less power than we're uh, using today. Uh, so why is there any difficulty whatsoever? And uh, so, uh, well, here I'm, I have a couple of slides. I'm going to skip these. These are just telling you some of the properties of the wires on chip. And uh, this is the same slide I had before. So let's do, actually, I'll just tell you what I did on the slides I'm skipping. All I did was to calculate uh, the typical length of wires on chip and what is the typical noise voltage. And it shouldn't come as any surprise that the noise voltage on the wires is, uh, is measured in microvolts. And uh, so uh, the, um, uh, perhaps that isn't very surprising that it's measured in microvolts. Anybody who's ever used an analog oscilloscope, you go down to the lowest scale, the low scale is usually about one millivolt. Why? Because if you go below one millivolt, there's too much noise. It's not worth going any further. And indeed, if you calculate the noise just as I've done and assign a, 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 an RC a bandwidth and calculate everything out, you end up indeed with uh, a millivolt or less of uh, noise. So you could say, well, that's a property of the wires. And well, what, so how does the wire want to signal? The wire wants roughly 1,000 electrons at one millivolt each, and that would be a wonderfully efficient way to do signaling on wires. And uh, so that's rather nice. However, uh, what does the transistor require? And I'm going to show the transistor requires something very different. Uh, the transistor is a thermally activated device. It's controlled by the Boltzmann factor. 
and uh, the, um, well, the KT over Q is 25 millivolts, but you need a, uh, a much higher voltage to have a good on-off ratio. And uh, it's, um, uh, uh, it actually, re you, you require many, many KT, and the transistors really don't operate well unless you go close to a volt. So now we have a discrepancy. You can imagine a transistor uh, could operate perfectly well, maybe even with one electron, but at one volt, whereas the wires want 1,000 electrons at one millivolt each. So you have a type of mismatch uh, between what the transistors are able to deliver and what the wires would rather have. And uh, the mismatch has to do with the great discrepancy in voltage. Uh, and that is the wires want to operate at a millivolt, the transistors want to operate at a volt, and the penalty is voltage squared. The power penalty is voltage squared. So uh, there's a factor of 1,000 squared. It's a million. And that's essentially the reason why today's electronics is a million times less efficient than the theoretical limits. And it's this discrepancy. And to overcome this discrepancy, we have to find, uh, we have a choice, get rid of the wires. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. Or get rid of, the, rid of the transistors. I say we have to replace the transistor with a switch that works at a much lower voltage. And if we can get a voltage much below a volt, maybe uh, in the limit, maybe even a millivolt, uh, then we would be uh, uh, potentially a million times more efficient in our digital circuits. Uh, now, of course, uh, this is not really news. Uh, in the, the famous uh, paper by Gordon Moore, by the way, not published in a scientific journal, published, published in a trade journal, uh, almost uh, 50 years ago, he points out that the power is really going into charging up the wires and all the other capacitances. And uh, as we've made the wires shorter, uh, things have gotten better and better. And, and, uh, but now we've reached a certain point uh, where to make further progress, uh, we actually have to uh, uh, reduce the uh, voltage of operation. So uh, this, uh, you could call this a kind of new Moore's law. Uh, this is the one that says we need to uh, continually reduce the uh, energy requirements to perform a digital function. So what's possible? Uh, effectively, we have to make the new device, maybe it's a transistor, but it will be much more sensitive in switching on and off. And the, the sensitivity of switching has to do with the on-off ratio. Now, electric engineers like to talk about uh, the sensitivity, they, they say 60 millivolts per decade. And is, where, where did the 60 millivolts come from? Well, they like to go per decade. If you go for a factor E, then it's uh, 25 millivolts. So it's, it's just, this is just another way of saying Boltzmann factor. You've got to do better than the Boltzmann factor. You have to have a switch uh, that is significantly better. And in principle, it might be possible to have a switch which turns on uh, by a factor 10 uh, uh, with only uh, one millivolt. That would be great. Uh, then, uh, but that by itself would be inadequate. You also have to have a good on-off ratio. And if you go through the analysis, transistors are most of the time doing nothing. They're just waiting around. And so if, you, uh, uh, if, uh, if you're just waiting around most of the time, the on-off ratio matters quite a bit. And uh, an analysis shows that we'd like to have a million to one on-off ratio. Uh, finally, uh, you ask for uh, a miniaturization, which has to do with current density. And so the specification that is usually given is that a transistor should be able to deliver a milliamp per micron of size of the transistor. However, since we're planning to lower the voltage, uh, uh, that's not the right specification because we're dealing with a fixed impedance of the wires. If we lower the voltage, we don't need as much current. So the proper specification should not be a milliamp, but should be a millimo, uh, which is a millimo is roughly one over a thousand ohms. And, and that would be if you, if you could deliver that uh, conductance density, then you'd have miniaturization. And this is not the end of it. Of course, you have to think about manufacturability and reproducibility and so forth. But these are the main specifications to satisfy uh, for a new switch that would be um, uh, more efficient than, than, the than the transistor, could possibly replace the transistor in digital electronics. Uh, so there's a, a, a groundswell now, there's a, there's a search for coming up with a new switching mechanism that is more sensitive than the transistor. And I have here on this slide a montage of all the, uh, not all, but some of the concepts. 
and I'll just zip through them very, very quickly. You can imagine coming up with a new transistor, uh, uh, maybe with a steeper subthreshold slope. These are called uh, tunneling FETs, but there is no consensus of what the mechanism should be. There's some tunneling, but uh, it, it's, um, it's up in the air. Uh, what is a TFET? I don't think anyone knows. Uh, there's some clever concepts using ferroelectric gates. Uh, people talk about these materials with vanadium, they undergo metal insulator transition. That's a switch, okay. Uh, some people say we should go to low temperatures and then we can lower the operating voltage that way. Uh, some people say, well, we should stop communicating with wires, switch over to optical communication. There is some merit to that, especially for longer links. Uh, and then others say, wait a minute, we have a switch, the giant magneto resistance, it's a switch. And uh, so it, it, the on-off ratio is not very impressive yet, but it could, it could become more interesting. Or if someone would come along and invent a nanotransformer. Uh, so the nanotransformer would go from the one volt where the transistors are today, maybe transform you down to the one millivolt for the wires and back again. Uh, if we could invent something like that, that might uh, serve the task. Uh, then there are mechanical switches. You can imagine that you have a little cantilever with many charges. If you have many charges, you are still thermally activated, but uh, you have, a, um, uh, you have a, a much higher sensitivity. I'll just write the Boltzmann factor E to the QV over KT. Well, you can imagine if I have three charges, then it's obviously much more sensitive. I could have 10, I could have 50 charges, and I would make um, a much more sensitive switch. Uh, just to show you, there are so many ideas. Uh, electrolytic switches. Imagine you have two copper wires very close together and you played out a few atoms of copper and you bring about a short circuit. Boom, that's a switch. And then you uh, uh, unplate them, again electrolytically, and you've turned it on and off. Tremendous on-off ratio. This is actually under intensive research, but not for uh, computation directly, it's for, uh, for storage, for storage of information electrochemically. So he, th those are a bunch of crazy ideas. And uh, we, uh, the, um, I should mention that we have, um, at Berkeley, we have a new center to solve this problem. We're, we're supposed to uh, come up, we're supposed to introduce what is the switch that will replace the transistor. And we have a number of different approaches. I'm gonna show you the different approaches. We have to be completely open-minded at this stage. We don't know if it should be uh, mechanical or, or follow some other uh, uh, type of mechanism. So we're very open-minded. But it's a very nice project because unusually in the U.S., it's, it, we have a huge amount of money and we have 10 years. They've given us 10 years to come up with this. We have uh, 19 professors. Uh, I didn't point out on the first graph. We have professors from MIT, Stanford, and a few other uh, schools as well. And we're all supposed to be working together uh, on uh, coming up with a, a new switch. So I'll show you uh, some of the themes in the center. I'm the leader of the center, so I'm supposed to represent all the themes. So uh, one way to do this is to continue in solid state, a semiconductor switch. And what is the goal? Well, you could say, mm, you want to work at a millivolt, why can't you use a, a, a ordinary transistor? And uh, well, if you have an ordinary transistor, you have weak signals, and it's, it's quite a big energy cost in, in amplifying weak signals, so it's not really a solution. <laughs> Uh, what we're really looking for is this contrast. Today's transistors, when you turn them on, they turn on gradually, and it takes at least uh, three-tenths of a volt uh, to turn them on. And that's obviously not very sensitive. And we would like the turn on to be much more sensitive, to be more like a step function. And if you can come up with a switch that is so sensitive it turns on more like a step function, then we can use it, then that's it. That, then we can declare success. Um, you mentioned how can that ever be done? Uh, I'll give you a little hint here on that. It's, it's not as outrageous as you might think. And um, so I have to go back to solid state. Uh, we have uh, the Zener diode. This was invented in the 1930s. And it shows that if you go into reverse bias, uh, you make uh, the distance between the filled valence band and the empty conduction band, you make it very short and you can tunnel across. And indeed that is a type of switch, but you only see the switching action at far reverse bias, and then it switches. But uh, you need a big voltage, and we don't want this to happen at a big voltage. Hmm. And you say, ah, oh, there's another type of diode, the Asaki diode. So the Asaki diode, uh, it's very similar to the Zener diode. Uh, you have 
let's say, uh, some electrons, and uh, you have an alignment between the conduction band and the valence band, and you can uh, pass current by tunneling. But if you raise the conduction band into the forward direction, you can actually turn off the tunneling because you could end up with a situation where these electrons have no place to go. And indeed, uh, that is uh, what happens in the Saki diode. Uh, good conductor, good conductor, tunneling, tunneling. And then suddenly the conduction band and valence band become misaligned and the current drops and then it behaves like an ordinary diode after that. And uh, that is the Saki diode. So we have a, a new switching mechanism. The switching mechanism has to do with the alignment of the conduction and valence bands. And now I come to the backward diode, which was actually, I believe, invented after the Asaki diode. It's, it's somewhat similar to an Asaki diode. It has lighter doping, so that at zero bias, the conduction and valence bands are perfectly aligned. And uh, if you go further into reverse bias, uh, you can tunnel across. And you go from the filled valence band to the empty conduction band. Uh, however, if you go into forward bias, they get misaligned and uh, the uh, electrons have no place to go, and it behaves like an ordinary diode. So this is rather nice. The switching occurs right at zero volts. And uh, this was invented in the uh, 1960s, normally made out of germanium homojunctions. Uh, never worked very well. They are used uh, in, in, um, uh, for various types of circuits. Not, they're not used very much. The performance is not much better than an ordinary diode, uh, but in principle should be a lot better. Uh, so it's a rather interesting question. Why are they called a backward diode? You see, they, they, as a diode, they work better in the backward direction than in the forward direction. The forward direction, you're controlled by uh, the Boltzmann factor. In the reverse direction, you're controlled in principle by how sharp the band edges are. So we come to the idea that you, if you have such a switch, uh, you, it could be fantastic. It could be very sharp. But it depends upon how sharp the band edges are. Now, uh, when I teach class, and I'm sure this is true for most electrical engineering professors, we pretend the band edges are perfectly sharp. And if that were the case, this would be a fantastic device. It would, uh, it, you would miss a line by a few millivolts and the current would go on and off. Uh, but in practice, I cannot tell you how sharp the band edges are. The research simply has not been done. It's, it's, uh, it's a very sad commentary on the field. And it, it, it will tell you the band gap. But uh, there's nobody around who can tell us how sharp the band edge or the band gap is. Uh, and this is something where there needs to be a lot more research. But if the band edges were perfectly sharp, we would have a fantastic switch. So I want to contrast the, the uh, two forms of switching. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why it's a little controversial. Uh, devices are currently being made where uh, you have a certain uh, uh, tunneling distance. And if you go in, the, uh, in more reverse bias, the you modulate the tunneling distance and you turn the current on and off, and that's very steep, but uh, that gives you a steep response only at very low current density. Instead, uh, as of about a year ago, most of the people in the field realized we need a density of state switch, which should depend upon how sharp the band edges are. And uh, so, so uh, well, it's not that easy to make the, get them lined up. You have to dope heavily. And so what has emerged is a type of heterojunction uh, that looks uh, very promising. It's also very, very rare. Uh, it's the situation where you have the valence band in one material lining up with the conduction band in another material. And this is called type three. And uh, we are very lucky that nature has given us at least one example of that. And uh, this is the indium arsenide uh, gallium antimonide system. And uh, so without doping, without anything, the bands are lined up. In principle, it should make a fantastic switch. And starting about a year ago, uh, most of the people who are making tunneling FETs, they realized their previous device results were pathetic, and they are now switching over to this uh, system, and they're starting to get uh, much more interesting results. And you can see what the idea is. Uh, you could jump across and uh, have uh, switching action with only a small bias voltage. However, it's not a new idea. It was actually proposed by this guy, Joe Shulman, uh, at the Hughes Research Lab. He proposed it about um, 12 years ago. 
and it's very ingenious. And it's not surprising coming from Joe Shulman. He's one of the most respected uh, uh, device and semiconductor theorists in Southern California. So he came up with this idea of jumping from gallium antimonide, uh, jumping to uh, the conduction band of indium arsenide. And it's under intense research now. And this is an example of a structure that we've made uh, where we're trying to uh, do the same thing. Uh, let's say we have a quantum well in the uh, gallium antimonide side, a quantum well of indium arsenide, and we have a sharp level here, a sharp level here, and then the current then can flow uh, across, and uh, we could, we're looking for this very sharp uh, turn on. Right now, just these, the voltage spectroscopy would be fantastic information for us because, in principle, the voltage, the current, the IV curve should tell us how sharp the band edges are, which amazingly has never been measured. And uh, this is the same uh, structure. Uh, so, what is the, this new switching principle? Uh, the way to think about it is that you are simply trying to line up two energy levels. So, if you have two energy levels, and they're uh, lined up, current will flow. If they're misaligned, current won't flow. So here, y yes, indeed, current flows. But I could misalign them, and then the current will stop. And that's the type of switching mechanism we're looking for. Uh, but many things go wrong with the switching mechanism. Uh, for example, as you try to bring two levels together, they repel each other. This is part of uh, quantum mechanics. And, and then if they repel each other, how can you ever get them to line up? Uh, so that's a problem. I have here a, a bunch of slides just telling you all the problems. So I'll, I'll mention another. You have to get electricity in and out. So you have to connect, uh, connect this to a, a reservoir with a resistor. And as soon as you have connected the, uh, the quantum system uh, with a wire, uh, you get uh, a finite lifetime. And now the sharp level broadens out. Of course, this is exactly what we don't want. Uh, we end up with, uh, uh, with broadening, and we need these levels to be as sharp as possible. So that's a, a second thing that can go wrong. Uh, that can be dealt with. You have to have a compromise. You have to have electricity, but you also, it's, it's possible to make a, uh, a compromise that might be acceptable. And there are other ways of dealing with it. And so one of the ways of solving the quantum mechanical level repulsion problem is to uh, arrange uh, for the uh, tunneling transmission to be uh, smaller. This is against the whole uh, attitude in the field is we need as much tunneling as possible, but there's a limit. There's such a thing as too much tunneling because if you have too much tunneling, you have too much quantum mechanical level repulsion. So there are many issues. And, uh, and uh, the, you have to have a hierarchy of tunneling probabilities uh, where the tunneling probability is neither too big nor too small. Many issues like that. So this is a list of all the things that can go wrong. Uh, the uh, because levels could also broaden due to phonons, uh, broaden due to the Coulomb blockade, uh, and you could have uh, spectral sidebands, you get band tails, phonon assisted tunneling. Oh my God, so many things can go wrong. Uh, so, uh, but what is embarrassing to uh, uh, scientists is we know so little about these types of processes. Theory is weak, uh, very little experimental data. So, we are trying to. Um, uh, learn the science of this type of level broadening. And uh, so there's, there's some ideas. But it, once you have that two-terminal device working, you could make that into a three-terminal device easily with the transistor. You put on a gate, and this would be the on state, and the off state is where the uh, valence electrons have no place to go, and this would be just the transition between on and off. And, and in principle, you could run this, uh, you could, uh, your control voltage could be much lower, which is what the idea is. Now, surprisingly, as you go into this and you say, yes, I'd like to do this, uh, and it, it's, uh, I'd like to follow the density of states. So uh, basically, uh, it's how sharp these uh, bands are and how sharp that band edge is and so forth. If those are all sharp, you're fine. And you're, you're taking advantage of having a very sharp density of states. But as soon as you accept the idea of a density of states, then you say, well, wait a minute, density of states depends upon dimensionality. Okay, this is sort of well known. And so now when we describe a PN junction, it, many kinds of PN junctions. Uh, for example, uh, well, here's the common kind. The common kind would be uh, three-dimensional to three-dimensional. That would be very, that's, that's the normal PN junction. But there are many other kinds. And I asked my student, uh, tell me how many kinds of PN junctions there could be if you take into account dimensionality. 
So he counted them all up. I don't absolutely guarantee that there's no others. Uh, but uh, according to him, there are nine possible dimensionalities of PN junctions and that we shouldn't anymore talk about PN junctions. From now on, we should also say the dimensionality of the PN junction. Now, among these nine cases, it turns out this case is the most interesting. Uh, this is a two-dimensional, this is a quantum well to quantum well PN junction. And uh, you'll see in a minute why that one is the most interesting. This one is this bulk PN junction, not very interesting. And the other case is also reasonably interesting. 1D to 1D is also very interesting. And this type of 1D to 1D is also. So uh, let me show what the issue is. It, it, it seems like the sharp band edges would guarantee great performance. But if you look at how sharp the band edges are, even under perfect conditions with uh, 3D to 3D uh, PN junction, uh, the turn on is only quadratic in voltage. So it's not that sharp. And there's a, a few other cases. They're not as sharp as you'd like. However, uh, this case, which is basically quantum well to quantum well PN junction, it has a similar property that everybody knows about 2D quantum wells, is the density of states is a step function. And it indeed leads to a step function turn on. This is the ideal switch. So we, we are very strongly oriented toward making uh, quantum well to quantum well PN junctions. Uh, layer to layer, it's, it, it's uh, very appropriate that we're now, th we, we're talking about layered semiconductors have come into vogue. We have graphene, but graphene is not a semiconductor, but we have uh, other uh, layered semiconductors as we heard about uh, uh, from uh, Richard Friend, uh, that uh, we have molybdenum sulfide and, and other sets. So this, is, this is kind of interesting that you could do this maybe uh, with the uh, layered semiconductors and it would give you the perfect uh, switching characteristic. And there's other cases that are uh, uh, less interesting. Okay, so uh, density of state switch is affected by dimensionality. And uh, now uh, we've written a paper where all the different dimensionalities are treated. Uh, now there are nine different cases. It should have been nine papers, but we squeezed it all into one paper, which is ex uh, incredibly long paper, and you can look it up if you're interested in all different cases and how each case behaves uh, a little bit differently and uh, uh, different types of turn-on functions. Uh, I urge you to look this up. It's on, um, it's on the archive. Okay, uh, so what are some of the questions that we are trying to answer in our center? And that is we, we would like to see more cases of uh, type 3 band alignment. Uh, and this is the, what's very rare. And there's one example we have, the gallium antimonide indium arsenide. We'd like to have more examples where the valence band just lines up with a conduction band. And for us, that would be a fantastic switch. But we need some scientific knowledge. How abrupt is the band edge? We actually don't know. And we think it's wise to concentrate on two-dimensional to, in other words, quantum well to quantum well PN junctions. But we think it might be nice to go all the way to monolayers like molybdenum sulfide. And then we have many other issues, uh, manufacturing, reproducibility, et cetera. So these are some key scientific questions. Uh, but you could ask, uh, well, you have an idea. You think you're going to replace uh, all the transistors and all the chips? That's insane, because you, you can't do that overnight. You have to have a technological path toward achieving that. And uh, so let me suggest to you a, what I think could be a realistic uh, technological path. And that is the backward diode has never fulfilled its functions. The backward diode kind of works like this with the uh, uh, gallium antimonide and the indium arsenide. And uh, as a transistor, it would work like this. You'd go through and um, uh, chug along and uh, go up and uh, um, uh, make, uh, uh, make your... Um, uh, essentially, uh, this vertical conduction is the switching function. So that's the backward diode. The backward diode, I remind you, the IV characteristic, if, excuse me, this is, should be current versus voltage, I, the, the IV characteristic is essentially like that, and then it turns on in the reverse direction. Now, if we had one that worked well, this would have actually many analog functions. It would be uh, essentially make every sensor more sensitive. It would make every photo detector more sensitive, and especially in the detector circuit. This extreme nonlinearity would uh, affect wireless because it could, could be used even as a discrete component in radio mixers. So I envision the path for this technology 
is first we demonstrate an outstanding two-terminal device. And, and then we have many, many uh, functions, even as a discrete component. And then someday we might think uh, about turning it into a transistor. So that's the kind of roadmap uh, that um, I have in mind. Um, so I went very quickly. There are obviously uh, uh, a bunch of these other cases. Uh, let me uh, show you uh, some of the other ways of accomplishing the same goal. I, I, I touched on it briefly. Uh, there are ways of making a micro or nanomechanical switch. It could be, it, it's, uh, it's kind of fantastic because if you have a, a nanomechanical contact, at two nanometers it's an insulator, at one nanometer it tunnels. All you need is one nanometer of mechanical motion and you have a switch and it with fantastic on-off ratio. So this is being researched and we have uh, one of our um, uh, themes in our center is to get the switching voltage down to 10 millivolts just for a nanomechanical switch. Uh, and um, uh, there's also a big role for, well, uh, magnetic effects. There's magnetic switching. There's more and more. Uh, the magneto resistance is very famous and uh, used in hard disks, but the, um, they're very proud they can change the, re the resistance by 500%. Uh, that's a 5 to 1 on-off ratio. We need a million to 1 on-off ratio. Uh, but I should mention, I was in Japan two weeks ago. Uh, it seems like uh, there's been an outstanding discovery now. Uh, there is a type of magneto resistance which has a 20,000% uh, change in resistance. And uh, uh, th that, that's, that's uh, is based on uh, different materials and so it needs to be looked at. And of course, there's optical. There are many things you can do optically. So uh, the conclusion, well, uh, we thought this was a very bold program, but usually a company like IBM is much more conservative, uh, but they're on board. Uh, the, uh, even though they're big blue and they're very conservative, they say, yes, it's time to reinvent the transistor essentially as a uh, more sensitive device that can operate at lower voltages with six orders of magnitude of power reduction. And that six orders of magnitude is kind of a new Moore's law. Uh, now, helping me in this uh, project, uh, I have uh, many... Um, uh, many uh, colleagues, you probably know some of these people, uh, but leading the nanomechanical effort is Professor King Liu. Uh, the optical effort is led by uh, Ming Wu. Nan nanomagnetics is led by Bokor. We have uh, all these uh, faculty from uh, Berkeley and uh, many of them from uh, MIT. We have Philip Wong from Stanford and also Tuskegee University is also represented. So it's a, it's a big uh, national effort. We'd like it to be international. We would love to have international collaboration, especially with Israel. Uh, we also have the usual uh, suspects in terms of industry. Uh, we have uh, uh, HP, IBM, and so forth, and uh, LAM research, and applied materials, and so forth. So I think um, uh, that's where I would like to conclude. And, uh, but I want to not just conclude, and then you ask me questions, what I really want to have happen is that there would be some students in the audience who say, well, there's this great idea. You haven't even considered that. And it's a new way to make a switch. And it could be the more sensitive switch. So if you have a, uh, an idea like that, you can email me. My email is online. And I'd like to hear about it. I'd like to hear about it in the question period as well. We're, we're very open to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, answers, the answers come from the audience. Yeah, no, answers. Uh, yeah. Can you say a few more words about the transformer approach? Um, the transformer approach, uh, well, you can imagine uh, if you had a way to uh, boost or switch from a volt to a millivolt, you, you could get the job done. But then the question is, how do you make a nano transformer? And uh, there are ideas. I'll show you one idea, which is a little bit wild. But we have to be wild. We have to accept uh, wild ideas. Let's see if there's space here. Um, the, um, if you make a sandwich, uh, and this would be a capacitor, and here you have a, a ferroelectric. So ferroelectric, let's just do that, ferroelectric. And here you have, let's say, SiO2, which is a normal insulator. Uh, now, the ferroelectric has some uh, very unique properties. You can actually get negative capacitance on the ferroelectric. And when you have negative capacitance, that looks like inductance. And now this looks like uh, an LC circuit. And 
if you have an LC circuit, uh, you can actually boost, raise and lower voltages. And, and this, is, uh, 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 this is the scheme. It's a good oral exam question, by the way, is that you tell someone you have only inductors and capacitors and you have 220 volts coming out of the wall outlet, but you want 1,000 volts. Tell me how to get to 1,000 volts. And of course, if you put an inductor and capacitor in series, you can build up very high voltages. So that, uh, that's one way of thinking about it. Uh, some people say that these giant magneto resistance is like a uh, transformer because it could be actuated with current at low voltage, but as you have the magneto resistor switch, it could switch a high voltage. So there, there are various ways of envisioning a nano transformer, but I would prefer some way that we haven't heard about. So uh, I'd like ideas for nano transformers. Uh, so that's an excellent question. Uh, let me repeat it uh, just uh, for the people who hear this online. Uh, what, if you could do this optically, what would be the fundamental limits? And of course, we're, we're very, we are doing, that's one of the themes, is to do communication on chip optically. Now this used to be a crazy idea, but silicon photonics has now emerged. Uh, we use uh, photonic communication, but it's not so much on chip, it's IO, it's input output from the chip. Uh, where we have a chip and then we send it over uh, medium distances, maybe a meter optically. That's already a technology and uh, millions of units have been sold. But uh, the question is, can it be done on chip? Where now, well, now we are competing with wires. And so the general belief is that for very, very short distances, nearest neighbor, transistor to transistor, we would never use optics. But there are certain functions on chips where you go rather a longer distance maybe a millimeter. And then optics emerges as a uh, candidate uh, for going uh, those distances. And it could potentially be more efficient than having very long wires. Think about it, if you use a wire, you have to charge the entire wire, you have to charge it to a volt. Uh, and uh, so yes, optics uh, could be better, but what are the limitations? Well, if you just talk about uh, having a good signal to noise ratio, you need about 15 photons just to deal with the shot noise. So 15 photons would be wonderful when you consider that today we require 15,000 photons to represent one bit. So right there, there is room for a factor of 1,000 reduction. Uh, and but I think this is still true today. We, are, we, we communicate optically with 15,000 photons. It's not just the source of the photons and using fewer photons. It's also the photodetector. Because if you have such a weak signal, it takes a tremendous amount of power in the preamplifier to amplify weak signals. And so if you look at a total power balance in optical communication, we, sure, we pay a lot for the photons. We may even pay a lot for the modulator, but we pay an equal amount for the uh, preamp the f that amplifies up the very, very weak signal. Uh, so there's room for doing this. So I'll, I'll tell you what our approach is. Our approach for the photons is instead of using a laser, is to use a, an LED. And there's some new physics in high-speed uh, uh, LEDs. We, th we think it's possible to have spontaneous emission faster than stimulated. Uh, this would require optical antennas. And optical antenna enhanced LED uh, could go uh, very, very fast, could be a terabit per second. But more importantly, being an LED, there's no threshold current. So we only pay for the photons we use. And then the, the second thing would be the photodetector. And there the secret is to do nano. Make a very, very small photodetector, a little speck of germanium, for example, uh, and uh, then 15 photons onto a tiny, uh, a tiny uh, photodetector. You'd have very little capacitance, and uh, you could uh, build up a big voltage, and you wouldn't have to pay such a big price in the preamplification. Once you have a signal bigger than about 25 millivolts, the cost of amplification is uh, fairly modest. So you have to be able to uh, turn these 15 photons into a 25 millivolt signal. So it's a low capacitance photodetector. And those are the two strategies. So both are important, the source and also the detector. And if this all works out, and, and we're very lucky, it might be something that could compete with wires 
on a chip. Uh, but it's, it's going to take uh, uh, completely new technology like this. Is your response you refer more to the communication or interconnect program? Yes. I was, she was very interesting also. She's very interesting. Yeah. Ah, okay, so uh, your real question was optical switching. So uh, I have been opposed to optical switching for 30 years. Uh, I'm sorry to be so uh, backward about that, but uh, if you look at the, and I think many uh, engineers agree with me on this. If you look at uh, the functions, uh, let's say digital or logic functions, and uh, w what you have to achieve, um, the, uh, the photons are terrific for communication because they're bosons and they, they don't interact and they can go uh, longer distances. And uh, the electrons, because they do interact, are perfect for switching. And I think this prejudice already is well, normally I'm against the conventional wisdom, but I think in this case I'm agreeing with the conventional wisdom uh, that the optics should be used for communication and uh, something more electronic uh, should be used for the logic. But I, I, I recognize that it's dangerous to be uh, obstinate about that. Okay, so uh, the question is about memristor uh, logic. And I first have to define what a memristor is. Uh, a memristor is a uh, type of electrochemical switch with memory. So you can imagine that you have, uh, well, it's not that different from what we had with the copper Remember we had, let's go back. I think we might be able to find it. Oops, wrong way. Okay, so you can imagine that if you pass a little bit of current, uh, you could actually uh, sh short, short out the copper. And uh, then the switching state is a function not of the current, but of the integral of the previous current. And if you're a function, if you have a voltage that is a function of the integral of the current, it's called a memristor. And it's kind of a nice device. It, uh, there's a uh, beautiful analysis that has been done. It's very symmetrical with the other types of uh, 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 devices we have in electrical engineering. Uh, mostly it's being used, of course, memristors are being proposed for uh, memory and for storage. Uh, but for logic, uh, I, I happen to think it has a shot. Uh, but the memristor people, uh, uh, they, are, uh, they would be happy with one volt. And uh, let me say why. If you're doing storage, and uh, then it sits there for a year, and then you access it, uh, then you don't really care that you spend a lot of energy creating that state. And so they have enough problems just uh, competing with all the other storage technologies. Uh, they don't want to listen to me and say, hey, that's, that's a great switching mechanism. You should think about lowering that to a millivolt. Uh, and uh, they say, no, no uh, we have enough problems. Uh, so I think it's, it's something that uh, should be uh, uh, taken more seriously. Maybe it will be, but they're in a very stiff competition with all the other types of storage mechanisms, your phase change and your, uh, uh, your nanotubes, and all the other schemes. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very open to the idea of using an electrochemical method for logic. Uh, but uh, uh, to mention what the, what the real problems are is that if you're plating copper to copper, Seemingly, it should not require any voltage. I can't make this disappear for some reason. Normally, it's supposed to, my, my eraser is supposed to work. It just stopped working. Now oh, there it is. Um, uh, so uh, it should work. If you plate copper to copper, electrochemically, that's the same, uh, uh, same energy. So that, maybe that could get by with millivolts. But in practice, in electrochemistry, there's always an overpotential. So if you go very, very slowly, yes, it would only require millivolts. But if you want to go at the speeds we're interested in, maybe it would require a half a volt again. And so we, it's self-defeating uh, in that respect. And that's also why the memristor uh, people don't want to talk to me, because uh, they're, they're, they have enough problems and, uh, just at a volt. And so uh, I, I think uh, uh, all of these things might work, but uh, we have to find a way to get to low voltage. Uh, yes, so uh, let me uh, repeat the question, uh, and, the, and the, uh, the question was uh, seemingly the fundamental limit, and I'll, I'll repeat what it was, Let's see if I can find some space here, okay, I'll erase this stuff. Uh, the limit was uh, uh, 40, 
uh, 40 kT uh, per bit, and nothing was said about a distance. And uh, the, uh, the second part of the question, remind me, the second part? Okay, well, where, oh, yeah, the second part, where is the balance between why does optical communication work better at longer distances? Right. Okay. Okay, so uh, here the, uh, there's seemingly no, no, no distance in it. Okay, and indeed that would be the case. You could have uh, a very long wire and it still should be 40 kT per bit. Uh, but uh, what happens, of course, on, on a chip, we don't have infinitely long wires. In fact, uh, the wires are RC limited. And so the wires tend to uh, have a limit, maybe a 100 micron wire. And after 100 microns, then you put an amplifier on, and you boot re, uh, or repeat, or you boost the signal, and you go the next 100 microns. And that's how you go long distances on chip. Uh, now, uh, what would happen then, as, as derived, it's correct. But what would happen, uh, let's say you did it with an incredibly long wire, a meter long wire. And uh, th th that should work. Uh, but then if you analyze the voltage requirement, it would be way down in the, um, in the microvolts. And indeed, a long, long wire has a lot of capacitance, and the noise on a long, long wire is actually less because it has so much capacitance. So now you're, it makes the, the voltage mismatch even worse. Uh, the, uh, you're, you're down to uh, microvolts of signaling. You still have 40 kT. You, you've distributed that over a very long wire. It's okay. You only have microvolts on the wire, but it exacerbates the problem uh, even further. Uh, so um, uh, the, uh, the way we ended up with a millivolt is I took into account, on one of the slides, I took into account the actual length of wires on chip. The longest wires are RC limited, so they tend to be 100 microns. Uh, so uh, when you have all those repeators and, you, and they're, and they're reboosting the signal to one volt, then the long distances get to be very problematic, and then the optics can come in. And, and that's where you find the trade-off. So there has always been a distance trade-off, a distance beyond which optics, optical communications makes more sense. That trade-off used to be kilometers, and now it's down to 10 centimeters. And with new technology, maybe it can get down to a millimeter or less than a millimeter, and then it can, it can go on chip.